are you going, my little man? Crossing the mountain with a gun in your hand. Gonna join the miners in the Coal Creek town. Gonna light the torch and burn the stockade down. Gonna free the prisoners, let them steal and rob. Gonna turn them loose for they took the miners' job. Convicts are working in the deep coal mine. They took the miners' job, now all the children are crying. The miners are coming from near and far. Take a little hand in the coal creek war just to do their part in the coal creek war. Thousands of commuters cross the Clinch River on I-75 north of Knoxville each day without realizing that a war and two mine disasters killed hundreds of miners near there over a century ago. Green signs on the interstate mark that town as Rocky Top, but gray headstones of those dead miners still call it Coal Creek. For such a small community, such a small area, there's more history per square mile in Coal Creek than any place I have seen in my life. And it wasn't just uh, coal mining related, uh, it was so much more. Despite economic booms and busts, Coal Creek is not without luminaries in its history. Anna Catherine Wiley was born there in 1879. She won national claim as an impressionist artist and has recently found new fame in East Tennessee's art circles. Harvard University boasts of having the world's largest collection of Welsh language books published in the last half of the 1800s. David R. Thomas of Coal Creek donated that collection to Harvard. He was one of many Welsh immigrants who came to the area to mine coal and mill iron at the start of the Industrial Revolution after the Civil War. Things were booming from, uh, from the end of the Civil War until 1877, but at that point, the, uh, the, the Knoxville Iron Company, that was the, the company that started the first coal mine in Coal Creek, uh, they, there was a recession, and when, when there's a recession, you make cuts. The uh, Knoxville Iron Company cut wages for the, uh, the miners. Miners went on strike to regain their wages, but in 1891, another mine, this time in Bryceville, started using convicts. And at that point, the, uh, the miners realized that if they let it continue, that it was going to be the end of their, their uh, profession there. Coal Creek even has a connection to the outlaw Jesse James. Henry Baker, who rode with the James Gang, was later arrested in Tennessee and sentenced to hard labor in the mines of Coal Creek. That was until 1891 when Coal Creek miners captured him and his fellow convicts so they could be sent to Knoxville with a message that convicts would no longer be allowed to take jobs from free miners. They marched them to the train depot in the town of Coal Creek, put them on a train to Knoxville and sent a telegram to Governor Buck Buchanan saying, you're not going to work convicts in Coal Creek anymore. In response, Governor Buck Buchanan sent in the Tennessee National Guard to restore order, thus starting the Coal Creek War. Although the miners lost the final battle in 1892 at Fort Anderson on Militia Hill, they won the war when the state abolished convict leasing and built Brushy Mountain State Prison. Well, life was good after, the, after that uh, period of time. The, uh, all the mines went back to work uh, after the war. Uh, opera houses were built uh, in Bryceville in the town of Coal Creek. Uh, and it became the most populated and prosperous part of Anderson County. But then in 1902, the mines grew still when the Freighterville mine exploded. In the early twilight of the morning chill, came 200 men down the freighter. 
Tears fill into the mouth So proudly they stroll Deep in the mine On the death tracks they roll But at 7.32 The mine shrill Then the mines grew still In Traders Ville Ten of them left farewell messages before suffocating, which were published in newspapers around the world. Jacob Vowell's final words to his wife were, Oh God, for one more breath. Ellen, remember me as long as you live. Goodbye, darling. The blast ignited a change in American history eventually bringing to the forefront coal mine safety practices aimed at better protection for miners. In 1910, the U.S. Bureau of Mines was created and got its first test when the Cross Mountain Mine exploded in Bryceville on December the 9th, 1911. Although 84 miners died, five were rescued, marking the first use of modern self-contained breathing apparatus in mine rescue and the first occasion in which canaries had been carried into the mines to warn of toxic fumes. Does the Tennessee Department of Education recognize the importance of the Coal Creek labor saga? There is no doubt because it is now part of the state's education curriculum. The title of the new textbook, Raise the Children the Best You Can, comes from Jacob Vowell's farewell letter. You can validate his words by supporting the Coal Creek Miners Museum and visiting historic sites where the miners lived and died. Come see the cannon on Militia Hill, fire on Coal Creek, or read the farewell messages on headstones of the miners who wrote them. Who knows? You might come face to face with the ghost of miner Dick Drummond, who was lynched during the Coal Creek War. You know, you see people come from all around the world to look at the American story. And, you know, it always kind of makes me think, you know, why are they here? Why are they looking at things that really probably don't have meaning to them? But, you know, as we, as our thoughts and ideas are shaped, when you can look and see what was the reason the people of Anderson County, you know, went in this direction? Why did they decide, you know, why did they make this particular decision. Seeing the story or seeing the background to that is very important. It helps people as they frame their own ideas. What is unique about the Coal Creek Miners Museum is proximity to Coal Creek history. If you go to a, another museum, you might be able to see an artifact but you can't then leave the museum and travel a few miles and see where that artifact came from. You can do that in Coal Creek. I imagine my, my grandfather and his brothers, it's dark. Here's how I picture it in the mornings. I'm, that morning I think they get up and, and grandmother fixes this breakfast, a good warm breakfast, and she has a tin bucket that she has his lunch fixed in. And I think about this day that I can imagine him going and bending over the cradle and kissing my mom and saying, see you tonight. And uh, then they go out and the boys, it's, day, it's not daylight, and they're bumping one another and kidding one another like brothers will do, and, and they're walking to the mine. And, and they go in there, and that's how I think of them, being happy. Learn their stories, teach them to your children, and your commutes across Cold Creek's hallowed ground will never be the same.